I want to share with you a little information about Ellesmere. Saria Owen made history when she won election. Your particular interview to be preserved by the Kentucky Historical Society, so it'll be available at any time, 24-7, for years to come, once it's archived there for anyone who wants to know about Miss Serena Baker Owen. So let's talk a little bit about you today. What I would like to know, first of all, is could you please tell us about your female lineage? How much do you know about your uh, grandparents? How far back can you go? And just tell us a little bit more about the females uh, in your family. I just want to say thank you for this opportunity. Really appreciate you. And um, you're one of the most important women in my life. So I want to thank you, Ms. Pam Owens. You're well, amazing. Thank you. And I appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. And uh, so the women in my life um, have been a tremendous blessing and uh, um, just a, uh, a blessing and, you know, a, a, a just really guided me and, uh, and my steps as God, you know, does. And we're a very faith-based family. So um, I am the daughter of Renee Baker Wilson, who is the daughter of Juanita Daniels Baker, who is the daughter of Jenny <laughs> Parks, D Jenny Daniels Parks, and um, the um, and she is the um, daughter of of a slave who was owned by Colonel Parks here in Kentucky hmm. and um, and we also had and so on the the plantation um, there were also other um, you know members of our family which we have um, family members who are also a Native American um, we have Cherokee in our family and this is and we are on the land of Cherokee and so we actually have a family member named Pocahontas. Oh. <laughs> and, um, and so um, I'm not sure which war Colonel Parks, who owned um, our relatives, you know, fought in, but, um, but we believe that, it, you know, it was during the era of slavery and it was around, you know, that issue. Oh, around the Civil War uh, time. Yes, ma'am. Wow. Well, that's very interesting. Now, what part of Kentucky is your family from? Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm originally from Louisville, Kentucky. I'm here in Northern Kentucky by way of college, Northern Kentucky University. And um, so, when I graduated from high school and came to Northern Kentucky University at the age of 18, that's kind of where I began growing up in Northern Kentucky. <laughs> Um, that's how I see it because I was still young <laughs> and then I uh, made roots here with my family my children mm -hmm. and um, and my husband this is where I got married and this is where we are but um, the rest of our family we have a lot of family and, and we uh, we joke a lot and have great take great pride that a lot of our families from Paris Kentucky so mm -hmm. I grew up you know, saying, hey, my family's from Paris. <laughs> We're from Paris. And, and folks are like, oh, wow, Paris. <laughs> Paris, Kentucky. Uh -huh. <laughs> so um, so we have a lot of family that is from pa Paris, Kentucky. And um, they said also settled in Louisville. Yeah, oh. you know, Louisville, Kentucky. So probably because it's more of a metropolitan area with, um, you know, more businesses and resources you know, in Louisville, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing that information and that story about your family with us. Um, I, I see where uh, your solidarity, your resiliency comes from as you talk about the family and, and the background and the heritage. Can you share with us a little bit about the Black Lives Matter movement? In particular, you may not know much about the organization yourself. If you do, you know, you can share that with us. But there were some events that happened uh, 
during 2020 uh, that rippled into 2021, some happenings. Can you share with us, did you participate in anything that happened uh, regarding that movement? Uh, and when I say that happened, that was the George Floyd and the Breonna Taylor in particular uh, incidents that happened where the police were actually accused of murder for both of those. Mm -hmm. And uh, during that time, a lot of things happened. And since then, you know, moving on up to the day, uh, a lot of things are still happening. But, you know, attitudes, perceptions, all of that changes. So could you please share with us your perspective about some things that happened during the Black Lives uh, movement uh, mm -hmm. during 2020? 2021 and on into today. I'm not a, a part of the organization, yes. um, but I do believe that our, our lives do matter, Black lives matter, um, as well as other lives matter. So from a faith-based perspective, we're all a part of the same family. We're all children of God. And um, so I, you know, I believe, it, that's why it doesn't bother me to hear you know, um, folks say, well, all lives matter. Well, yes, all lives do matter. Um, but as far as the movement, um, black lives matter as well. And that's where that phrase comes from, is um, because of um, horrific in incidents, well, not even incidents, but, you know, murders um, and the lives taken um, from black people um, because of hatred and racism. And the movement um, was started and created to, you know, as a, a way, a cry, a cry out, you know, that, that we matter, we're here, we're a part of this beautiful family that God created. And that includes all of us. And all of our lives do matter, including black people who have been devalued and um, not often, you know, heard or um, accepted and included. And, um, and, and so um, I personally, you know, still um, feel sorrow and grief, you know, for um, the lives lost, like, you know, my brother George Floyd and sister Breonna Taylor. You know, um, their lives didn't have to be taken, and that was wrong. So, as far as the the movement, um, I do believe that our lives, that Black lives matter. We do, just as other lives matter. Mm -hmm. And I believe all of our lives do matter. And um, I'm the daughter of a, a police officer, a retired police officer. And um, so... I appreciate um, the, the their service, wow. the service of, and I know that there are good police officers like my father who um, got into the field so that he could um, help be a, a role model and help um, serve in our communities um, and um, and help guide you know young black children, mm -hmm. you know where there was this absence or void of. Um, I, I guess um, security and professional or, um, leadership mm -hmm. and even maybe even um, a void of fathers in their lives and so my father you know stepped up after the military because he's also a marine veteran just like my husband um, who's a marine veteran and a retired teacher <laughs> but when my father entered the field of law enforcement, um, that was his goal, to, um, to help protect the lives and not take lives, which, you know, a lot of black lives have been taken at the hands of police. So I do know that there are re really good, you know, officers like my father who value us, who care about us and, you know, take pride and time, mm -hmm. you know, to, um, to give back to our community. Well, it's you know, it's good. That. So I don't believe in defunding the police, <laughs> which is one of the, I think, um, 
the goals of the Black Lives Matter organization. Uh -huh. And so that's why, like, I'm not a part of the organization, but I do believe in the philosophy of our lives matter, just right. as all lives matter. Right. Black lives do matter. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to explain that and share your perspective on it. And coming from the fact that your dad was a police officer who's retired, but also the fact that he served in the military too. So depending on what you've seen helps form your perspectives. And that's what this interview is all about today. Okay. So, uh, so um, the, the, my roots um, are in education. My grandmother um, retired from education and uh, she began, and, and I really looked up to her and my mother um, they're a, a voice, you know, served as a voice for others and, uh, and, uh, loving leaders, you know, within our churches and community. And so, um, she was in NAACP. My mother's in NAACP. I was also a part of, uh, the, um, National Association of Negro Women. Oh, okay. And, um, it, and so, um, so they've, they've really, you know, helped um, order my steps and kind of uh, guide me in the way of like promoting, helping others. Mm -hmm. So one of the things, you know, as far as, you know, being a faith-based woman is, you know, loving my neighbor. And one of the ways we can do that, and this is, and so you all see the <laughs> the hat That's love beautiful. um I've always been taught you know whatever I do do it in the spirit of love and so a lot of folks who see me they see me with my love hat on yes. and uh it's just one of my signatures <laughs> I have al always been activists and you know like these loving leaders who stand up for what's right and um so that's you know what encouraged me and motivate me to, you know, be as involved as I can, you know, within our churches and communities. That's why I'm, I serve on our deaconess board. I'm also a missionary, mm -hmm. you know, um, within our church at First Baptist Church of Ellesmere. And, um, you know, and my mother, she's been a church secretary. My grandmother was a church secretary for years. And, they were, they were both missionaries before my grandmother passed away. My mother's still a missionary. But um, just that's why I'm involved I am in both, you know, the NAACP branch and Cincinnati. I'm able to, um, I think the Cincinnati branch kind of does a little more by way of activism mm -hmm. um, within the communities. And, uh, and I love that, you know, any opportunity that, you know, I have to help people, which is my calling in life, then, you know, I'm happy to serve and help others. So I just kind of, you know, get more opportunities to help um, by way of like voting rights, voting empowerment, helping to educate and empower others. Um, also, you know, to, um, we've also served as um, election poll workers. You know, my mother's actually done that for 25 years. <laughs> wow. She's been a, a poll worker. And um, and my mother's Renee Wilson, Renee Baker Wilson. And um, so just her um, her guidance and her being a role model has inspired me and encouraged me to get as involved as I can um, with organizations like NAACP and then now also the Poor People's Campaign with uh, Dr. Reverend Bar William Barber uh -huh. um, who um, has started a movement, actually uh, continued the movement of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, for civil rights. And, um, and so now with the Poor People's Campaign, which is a national call for moral revival, we're, um, you know, trying to encourage and, um, and, and, you know, show leaders, even though I'm a legislative leader myself, um, I get it. <laughs> I know the assignment, <laughs> you uh -huh. know, let's love, you know, loving our neighbor includes, you know, making uh, laws and legislations, empowering people, but making sure that people's um, 
their both most basic needs are met mm -hmm. you know like they have food they have shelter you know they have um, security they're safe and um, they, they're educated and they have access to jobs with uh, fair wages and things like that and clean mm -hmm. water and clean air so um, you know the Poor People's Campaign, this movement for uh, the National Call for More Revival, is, is, has really um, inspired me as a leader, uh -huh. you know, to, uh, to do all that I can to make sure that, you know, everyone has what we need to survive. We all have, have that right. Well, that's a great calling. And uh, when we talk about solidarity and resiliency, what you're speaking about is definitely both of those aspects. You've been going at this for a long time, a very long time. And uh, you had spoke about the fact that uh, you advocate. Um, I know that uh, we had talked earlier and you said you don't like to use the word protest. So I would like for you to tell our audience today why um, you don't uh, speak of uh, events as being a protest but you're down in Frankfort, Kentucky, an awful lot uh, there speaking up in regards to different um, motives or, or, or movements that are going on. And uh, a lot of people say they're protests. So let's talk a little bit about your involvement with some of these uh, actions that happens uh, at our Capitol. Thank you. Um, yes, and you're right. That's what they are. They're, they're actions and movements. Um, in the spirit of love <laughs> and peace and um, and the main goal is to build relationships and empower people um, to love you know love one another to show love to demonstrate that so um, instead of uh, using that's why I don't use the the word protest you know folks are not protesting um, a lot of times they rally cries for help and um, you know in initiatives they're um, they're movements of peace to um, you know help bring folks together you know to say hey we're all in this together you know God put us here on this earth together we can um, we can build and do great things you know if we come together in love and peace if we work together and that's you know everyone from you know children and folks within our communities to leaders you know legislators um, we can do this together we can build you know great great and um, healthy communities and a whole democracy you know within um, our communities our state and our nation so that's why I go to to Frankfurt and meet with our our legislators and also meet with local legislators as well and I encourage those who um, who meet me or know me you know to um, you know to share their concerns with me so as a legislator you know I want to do all that I can to you know um, lift up folks and help them you know any way I can and then I go to Washington DC and do the same thing oh. Well, I, I know that you are involved with Kentuckians for the Commonwealth. Um, is that where most of the legislator role kicks in? Um, well, the, my, leg my role as a, a legislator, so I was elected, you know, to be a school board member. So um, they're nonpartisan. The Kentuckians for the Commonwealth is a nonpartisan organization that um, just really helps educate and empower people. And um, they provide a platform for voices to be heard. So, um, like you've helped, you know, um, helped us many times at um, people's hearings. So we have people's hearings um, to um, to help local community members lift up and share concerns, you know, they, that they have within their schools, communities. And my daughter Destiny, she's also, you know. Um, a young leader who um, helps advocate through art mm -hmm. and um, my son uh, Jabril does the same thing as far as like you know just helping educate and his focus 
is um, character building, you know, helping our youth build character and be good role models. And then he uses sports, you know, to do that, um, to reach, you know, our young, you know, teens and young adults. Um, so they both have, you know, their advocacy and do that, you know, in different ways. Mm -hmm. And so we, as a, an organization, Kentuckians for the Commonwealth, encourage that creativity. How can you use your talents and abilities to, um, you know, to help, you know, others and um, be the best you can be within your school and community? Mm -hmm. And uh, and so that's where that advocate, that passion for advocacy comes from. Um, yeah, and and I appreciate Kentuckians for the Commonwealth, their education piece. Mm -hmm. is we also um, help educate folks around election time. Right. We have a voter guide um, to help uh, voters be more informed so they can see where all of the candidates stand on various issues that affect their communities. Mm -hmm. So um, that's pretty awesome and amazing. And we take them to Frankfurt and to Washington, D.C. so they can build those relationships with legislators and help legislators know, like, Hey, you know, <laughs> that you know, it's our job as leaders, you know, to lead um, in a spirit of love and come together and uh, make that connection so that we can listen and we can learn, you know, from those who we serve mm -hmm. and we can be better leaders. Right, right. Well, thank you for sharing that about the leadership role in that regard and. Uh, Let's talk a little bit more about legislators. You know, you being a legislator, um, you are on the Erlanger Ellesmere School Board. As you mentioned, you said you're on the school board. So let's talk a little bit about that because that was a historic accomplishment. You know, <laughs> when you were elected to the school board lady, uh, first African-American on the school board, period. Well, congratulations. So uh, let's talk about that run for that, that uh, victory there. Thank you. Um, I want to just go back to um, the fact that I'm uh, a woman of faith. So uh, I did not know that God was going to call me to run for school board. And I've taught in the district. I taught at the middle school and as a, um, as a life skills teacher. And then I'm certified also. Um, and have taught, I've taught in this, in the Covington, you know, community as well as in Boone County um, um, as a, a middle school language arts teacher, but um, I did not know that I would be called to run for school board because I ran for city council and I thought God was going to call me to run for city council again. And that was um, something that uh, I did not know that that was going to happen because I, all I wanted to do was just fulfill my calling to be a loving leader. I knew God called me to um, to serve and help others. And folks were asking, so, you know, you're going to run for office? And I was like, well, if God calls me to, I will, you know, I'll be obedient and I'll run for office. And so I waited and that was kind of like my, my moment of just trying to stall because I guess a little bit of anxiety, you know, you know, about um, me not wanting to be a politician because there were all these kind of negative connotations and, you know, stereotypes about politicians, um, not really caring, you know, but, um, but then I started meeting, I met um, uh, Mayor Billy Bradford, who would come to our church a lot, and he, in every event, you know, that we have within the church and community, he was there. And I, and so that changed my, started changing my perspective about legislators. I'm like, well, he's a legislator and he's like always here for us. We see him, he shows up and he, he demonstrates he loves us. And so just went, so I kept just putting it off and uh, folks would say, well, Serena, are you going to run for office? Are you going to run for office? And I'll say, oh, if God calls me. And one day my phone rang. 
and I answered the phone and I was like, hello. And it was Mayor Bradford. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, Sister Owen. And then that's what they call him, you know, our deaconess. Uh -huh. I'm a deacon, deaconess at our church. Sister Owen, I'm like, oh, yes, sir. And he's, he says, um, you need to run for office. You need to run for city council. You know, go get your back in. And I was like, uh, and he, and then there's, then there was this pause. And he was like, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? <laughs> and I was like, yes, sir. <laughs> and he says, you need to run for office. And I was like, oh my gosh. And he said, go get your packet and you run for <laughs> office. And I was like, yes, sir. So we hung up. And then all I could do was just look up and I was like, okay, God. Like, he literally called me uh -huh. to run for office. Yeah. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so, so I was obedient and I ran and, um, and my, the, the numbers, the race was really close. Um, I lost by maybe under like 20 votes. Wow. And I did not know at the time that you can contest the you know, or ask for a recount. I didn't know. I was just being obedient and I was always, you know, I just enjoyed serving within uh -huh. the community. So you could just tell I wasn't really political. I didn't know to contest that. So I just kept it, you know, just continue to do what, what God was calling me to do as far as just continuing to serve. And, um, and a, a, a little over a year ago, God called me again you know, but it was to run for school board. Uh -huh. And the deadline had already passed and I had to run as a write-in. And I was like, oh, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this? But when God opens a door, you know, that no man can shut that door. Like, you know, so God made a way and um, I had three weeks to campaign <laughs> as a write-in. Uh -huh. That means, you know, just, you know, making connections, re, you know, reconnecting. But, um, but I re I'm really thankful, you know, for the years that I had taken time to build relationships within my community. And because of that, it made it a little easier because I was already connected. I was already involved. Mm -hmm. And so that's how people knew me. Oh, that's Serena. She serves within our community. We know her. So when they saw my name, it's like. You know, that's Serena. She's, right. you know, she's into this. She volunteers here. She volunteers this. She shows up for us, you know. Uh -huh. She listens and um, and helps us. So um, that that made it easier and just showing up for people. And then they showed up for me. And I got elected as a, <laughs> a write-in um, for the Erlanger Ellesmere School Board, serving as the first person of color on our, our school board. Since we've um, ever, but even you know more importantly, since we integrated in 1955. Oh. So I'm thankful to Rosella Porterfield. She was like the um, Rosa Parks of Erlanger and Ellesmere, <laughs> and so she paved that way because she helped integrate our school district. Oh. And um, I'm very grateful you know, for that. And so because of her, I was able to teach in the district at the middle school level and then now serve as a school board member. So I'm very grateful. <laughs> All right. Well, that is great. That's, that's good to hear, you know, the story about how you came there. The fact that, you know, you were in a different position first and then decided to go for this. And uh, the fact that Mayor Bradford, the late Mayor Bradford, we can say now, had a voice in uh, encouraging you mm -hmm. to seek political office. So it's good that uh, you have memories like that that you can share about the impact he had on your life and uh, politically and spiritually too, because he was a man uh, of God. Yes, a lot of, there are a lot of good um, pastors, you know, throughout Northern Kentucky who, yeah, who have been very instrumental. And I uh, like your pastor of Ninth Street. Oh, uh-huh. Yeah. Pastor Fowler. Right. Yes. Richard. Reverend Fowler. Um, he, he's very instrumental in the movement and, uh, you know, helping to lead and guide us to, you know, to love and lead, you know, and holding legislators accountable. Right. Um, well, that's, that's the main thing, uh, is holding your legislators accountable mm -hmm. and 
in that regard, uh, you have an organization, a nonprofit, right, called uh, Northern Kentucky Educators? Oh, okay. So um, that's our email. <laughs> that's your email? Okay. The Community Heroes is a really, uh, it's a nonprofit organization, okay. but um, it's just, it was a ministry, and it still is, just for many, many years. So in 2000, uh, my husband and I, as educators, would encourage our students. So after the, the Marines, um, my husband became a teacher, and he was teaching and coaching um, and mentoring at the, the elementary level. And then I was teaching and coaching, you know, like cheerleading. He coached basketball, and I coached cheerleading oh. at the middle school level. And... You know, we were like, so how can we, you know, be effective, you know, as far as like classroom management and um, encouraging students without um, being punitive? Uh -huh. You know, how can we do this in the most loving way and uh, do it with positive reinforcement? And so we came up that we've just started in our classrooms with um, encouraging, you know, students to keep up the great work and, you know, giving awards um, within our classroom and then at the school level um, with like student of the week and things like that. And so then that evolved into like just our everyday lives with encouraging people that we came across and businesses and organizations that served others. And so we'd be at a restaurant, um, and if um, this is just an example, and if the server provided great service, mm -hmm. I'd pull. Um, at, well, first I would ask the server to go get their boss. You know, can you please go get your boss? And they're like, is everything okay? <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, and then I'd, I'd say, well, yeah, you know, just need to talk to your boss, your supervisor. And they're like, okay, and so they're all nervous. And then they come back, and then I pull a plaque out of the out of my purse. <laughs> and nice. I tell the supervisor, like, first of all, we want to thank you, you know, for hiring such great staff. Like, this server was amazing, very attentive, very professional, and, you know, um, and we just want to thank them and honor them, you know, and say thank you for their outstanding service. And we want to thank you, too for, you know, seeing and recognizing, you know, greatness when, it's the, when you go to hire your, you know, your staff. And so we'd have this impromptu award ceremony right there in that business, <laughs> whether it's a restaurant or organization, just to say thanks. And at first, my son, he was in elementary when we started that. And he'd go, oh, mom, because I pull out an award, you know, and he's like, oh, mom. And then so he just got used to it and would look forward to like, Oh, I think they just, you know, they deserve an award. Uh -huh. Or or he'll just see, you know, if we go back to the same business, you know, um, my son would, would say, Oh, I think they, I think they, they're working for an award. <laughs> I think they want one. <laughs> it's nice. It became so, a family thing. It, it was. And, it, and so from the school, you know, with like student of the week and, you know, awards within our classroom to, you know, just, um, acknowledge and um, and honor you know those who are doing great um, we we took that to the businesses and organizations and called them you know just at Owen family outstanding service awards and then from that you know, we were like what, what else can we do what can we do to help build relationships we wanted to take it a step further uh -huh. so um, so then I stuck with the, the plaque and then would also like make certificates sometimes and then had like a trophy, you know, with a star and an eagle on it. And, uh, <laughs> and so, um, you know, we, we started to just honor it. And, and Mayor Bradford was one of the first, our first honorees uh -huh. for Community Heroes. So we showed up at the city council meetings and um, during public comment, <clears throat> We said, you know what, you all are pretty awesome, you know, and um, we, we want to thank the council, you know, for all you do, and we want to thank Mayor Bradford for showing up for us. Like, every time there's something going on in the community, he was there. And so we honored him with our first Community Hero Award. That's nice. And uh, to say thank you and, um, you know, and then help 
you know, share with others, like you can do it too and encourage others. And so from there, you know, just everyday people within our community, we wanted to encourage them to, um, you know, keep up the great work. They go above and beyond the call of duty to give back. And so we wanted a way to acknowledge that. And we would recognize them at their city council meetings and uh, help connect them with their le local legislators because we wanted the local legislators to see Look, you have great folks like Miss Pam Mullins, who's, who goes above and beyond the call of duty to give back. And we just want to help make that connection. Well, thank and, you. Uh, and then we wanted to encourage those who see, who watch the city council meetings, to say, wow, that's awesome. Maybe I might, you know, want to do something to give back to the community. So we're hoping and praying there's this ripple effect. And, um, you know, that is strengthening relationships and encouraging. Well, you're doing a very awesome job Thank in that you. regard, uh, and I have been a recipient of one yes, of the awards, uh, of proudly uh, <laughs> accepting that award, you know, and, and understanding and letting you tell the audience more about that. That's, that's another effort that you're doing uh, when we talk about solidarity, uh, keeping things solid, uh, being sure that people understand that they're cared about, the resiliency mm -hmm. piece of it. Mm -hmm ongoing uh, mm -hmm. the efforts and what you do do in that regard and another reason why I thought you would be an excellent candidate to interview and be a part of uh, this whole project you know and I'm so blessed to be able to talk with you today and have you share your experiences and your perceptions about uh, life and, and, and what has got you to where you are and uh, even uh, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, what do you believe is necessary to keep things moving on for the future. But I would like to talk a little bit about a topic uh, that folks are becoming more and more aware of and closer to with understanding uh, students who we call autistic and autism. And there's even uh, an awareness month. I believe it just happened recently. Um, I know in that regard that you have some special techniques and some things that you use and you utilize and uh, if you will share uh, with us just your perspective and your, sto your story about autism and, and, and some of the needs for uh, people who are just a little bit different with how they function than how we may choose to perceive and function with them. Thank you, and um, and first and foremost, like I, I really appreciate you including this um, within the interview um, because, like, again, we're all a part of the same family. We're um, we're and we all deserve love, everyone, and we and we have the ability, you know, to love one another and to yeah. value you know, one, one another, so I appreciate that, and um, autism, like, and you're right, uh, Autism Awareness Month is in April, but, you know, having a, a background in education, you know, we can all, you know, always, you know, take time to learn and educate ourselves a yes. little more. Um, this helps we grow and become better, yeah, and so, just better human. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, but um, but I didn't uh, learn about autism until uh, like my my son I, uh, my son actually attended the middle school that I taught in and when he was younger in elementary school he was attending my husband's school in Covington at Latonia Elementary and um, and and we know he. he we noticed, you know, that um, that he was struggling a little by way of like, you know, the social skills area, very bright. Um, but then there was some struggles, you know, when it came to like social skills and um, and communicating, you know, with others and kind of understanding when kids were joking and, you know, um, kind of not getting, you know, getting the jokes and. Um, and so, the, but the teachers, while they were amazing, mm -hmm. they all labeled him as like extremely shy. Oh, he's extremely, he's very shy man. You know, 
but he was he was also very brilliant and smart as well. Um, but he's a very, and talented because he was a great, you know, with basketball. But he mm -hmm. always looked at basketball as um, an assignment, like you know, mm -hmm. his job, his duty, you know, as a teammate oh. to get it done. You know, so I'm gonna go. I'm gonna do my job, and then like he'd win MVP, and the team would, you know, win the tournament, and he'd be ready to go home. Everyone else, we're ready to celebrate. Let's celebrate. Let's get. And he's like, but I've done my job. Now I'm ready to go home. You know, uh -huh. and we're like, you know, let's go bowling. Let's go celebrate. Let's have a, you know, the celebration. And he's like, I've done my job. I'm ready to go. You know. So um, we didn't quite understand until like middle school in that transition. So individuals on the spectrum um, have um, challenges when it comes to like transitioning and it was transitioning from elementary school to middle. And um, so it just became uh, more apparent that, um, that there were some real struggles because and, and then there was like, you know, this piece too where he was being bullied by adults at the school um, who had also, um, you know, one of his teachers actually threatened him because he was um, having a, like an a internal panic attack. He was a really great, um, well-mannered, you know, student and still is, mm -hmm. you know, he's on the quiet side, but well-mannered. Uh, now that as an, a young adult, very professional. But as a kid, just really quiet nature. And um, and when the, we didn't realize that the, um, the office that um, the, um, the gym teacher and the health teacher shared like a room. Mm -hmm. And so he was having a lot of anxiety about going into the building and the health teacher encouraged him, well, you can lay on a mat in my office and then go to your classroom, which was on my team. Mm -hmm. They called it team, like a set of classes, you know. And so, and then you can go, you know, to your classes once you're, you know, relaxed and you've, you know, kind of, you know, calmed down because he was having like this internal panic attack, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, was just, from a lot of anxiety, mm -hmm. um, and so so he went with her, and I was able to. I was about to use my last sick day, and then we. Um, I went on to my my class. He went with her, and I didn't realize she shared an office with a teacher, who had basically been bullying him, you know, um, and and so he was struggling with that, uh, and. My husband and I, um, in hindsight, when we learned not to do this again, um, always we, for some reason, we thought all educators loved the kids. Yes. Because we did. We yeah. were educators and we were in it because we wanted, we love, you know, our students and we, we were genuinely there to help all of the kids. And, um, <clears throat> And it wasn't until after what happened to our son, we were like, well, we're not going to, we're not going to make excuses for other adults anymore or um, assume that every adult in education, you know, cares um, about the kids. Um, so, so yeah, I went on to my class, I was teaching, and then the teacher that had been bullying him walked into my classroom during a lesson and had his back to the stu my students and uh, leaned in my ear and said, oh, I saw your son, you know, um, downstairs, which was an office he shared and I didn't realize that or else I wouldn't have let my son go, you know, um, to D, you know, kind of um, calm, you know, um, calm himself down there um, from his the panic attack he was having from his anxiety and so the teacher said yeah so um, he, you know he said he wasn't feeling well and I thought it was a sympathy visit and I was like oh yeah you know he's not feeling very well and the teacher said well um, 
you know, um, I, I, I told them, well, how about I punch you in your mouth and knock out all, all of your teeth? You know, would that help you um, mm -hmm. not worry about being sick? And he said that to a sixth grader. And you could, at the time, look at my son and tell he was, um, what he was labeled, you know, an extremely shy kid. You could just tell, you know, that he had, was a kid with a lot of anxiety, just in his appearance at that age. And so I was like, oh my gosh, to tell a kid, you know, that he's going to cause him bodily harm, right. you know. And he said, but Jabril didn't think that that was very funny. And then the kids are looking at me. My eyes are getting bigger. I feel like I'm going into mama mode. Like when I feel, I, mean, I am going into mama mode. <laughs> right. But I'm, you know, trying to still remain professional because I have a classroom full of students. Uh -huh. And it's not my nature to be, I'm, you know, very, um, I'm also, you know, quiet natured and um, I've been taught to, you know, have self-control and be well-mannered and so, and respectful. And so this, at this moment, it was like, what is, ha what's happening, you know? And he said, well, he didn't think that was too funny, you know? And then I was like, oh, well, because it's not. And I just knew an apology was coming because why else would this man come in and interrupt my right. class, you know? So, um, so I said, well, it, right, that wasn't funny, you know. And students are going, Miss Owen, you okay? You know, they're seeing, you know, me doing some mama mode, like. And, but they can only see his, the back of him, and he's in my ear, you know, whispering it. And he said, well, I figured if I punched him in the mouth, knocked out all his teeth, and the blood was gushing out, he wouldn't worry about being sick anymore. And I'm like, what? Mm. Mm. And I was thinking, as a faith-based woman, I was thinking, so he interrupted my, this teacher walks in the middle of my classroom lesson and he's telling me this, how he's just traumatized my son with this bottle, with a threat, you know? And I'm like, so surely he's here to apologize, you know, and make it right. As soon as he said that, he turned and walked out of my classroom. Hmm. And left me standing there in shock. And I'm like, and my students are like, Miss Owen, you okay? You okay, Miss Owen? And hmm. I'm like, trying to process what happened. And I'm like, please go ahead and finish your lesson. And then I went next door to the teacher that always, I don't smoke or drink or anything. And she always needed a smoke break. And uh -huh. would ask me to watch her class. And I was like, oh, I need that favor today. Uh -huh. You know, mm -hmm. I need right. to go check on my son. And, and she said, okay. And so I, I went to check on my son. The door was still closed and I opened up the door and he was in there just crying. And he was so scared when I opened up the door. And I was like, Jabril, are you okay? You, you know, and he was just crying. And he said, I didn't know I had permission to leave. I didn't have permission to leave. So he, and he's so, saying, like, yes. um, children or even adults, because I've learned myself that I'm an individual on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And I have a daughter who's also on the spectrum. And so I didn't, we, we, we didn't know much about autism at the time. All I knew is I love my students, and if I see they have various needs or they learn different, I'm going to accommodate. Uh -huh. And that's what his elementary school teachers did for him. Right. They just accommodated because they cared, but once he had transitioned to middle school, he didn't receive that accommodation. And, um, and you know, so we just had this different level of, you know, like having to wing it, having to just make do and uh, and so we were just trying to process what's happening um, because individuals on the spectrum are like very little mm -hmm. and um, so no one told him he had permission to leave he was still there even though he was basically attacked by a teacher and um, he didn't go back to school after that mm -hmm. uh, it turned into full-blown depression <laughs> Um, cause even, you know, um, um, I, I was able to, to get him to come with me. And then during lunchtime, one of the kids was like, your son is upset. He's crying. He wants to kill himself. Mm. And it just was like real, very, very traumatic. So, um, 
the church was the first place that a church in Cincinnati, because um, we were part of um, Christ Emmanuel, mm -hmm. and they had um, therapists. They had a church counselor. Oh. So we called, was like, our son's struggling, you know, with some things, and he really needs some help. And so that was like our introduction to therapy was oh. through the church. Through the church. And then from there, and uh, because, uh, because I also thought, well, I'm a teacher at the school, um, you need to go to the counselor too. You know, the counselor, you can trust the counselor, but I took my planning period and then he said, can you go with me then, you know, and then I went with my son to, who was a student, you know, so that he could see, he could trust the counselor, this is someone he could talk to, and the counselor asked why am I there and told me to go back to my class and told me that the teacher was just joking about punching him in his mouth and knocking out all his teeth so he wouldn't worry about being sick. But the effect it had on him was not a joking effect. Oh, no, right. no. And what teacher, like, if my husband as an educa a black educator yes. had said that to a student, being a man and a black, a black man, a black educator, he would not have been, been, been you know, a teacher any longer. Mm. Nothing happened to that teacher, but he got promoted, I think, after that, you know. And, and we were just like, you know, still me sharing the story yes. years and years later, you know, it's just baffling and it, it just shows like that traumatic effect mm -hmm. that it has. But um, it just caused me um, to do more to advocate, you know, um, so I'm a, I consider myself an advocate for disability justice, as you are. <laughs> and, um, and so, and I appreciate that about you and the and the, um, the shows that you produce to just help bring awareness. And so, Thank you. And my daughter, she's on the spectrum and she's a model for autism awareness, a fashion model for autism awareness that just help show folks within our communities that we're people too, um, we're part of your larger family and we have talents and abilities, you know, that we can utilize to help make our schools and communities um, great and uh, and so it, that's become a blessing just being able to advocate and help others in that way help give a voice you know to all folks of different abil abilities and so we don't really focus on you know what's the disability but what are our diverse abilities diverse abilities mm -hmm. i like that and so it, it is important you know for um, for law enforcement to um, to build those relationships, and that's what my father did as a, a police officer. His focus was building relationships with members in the community. Because if you know, you know, the families and the, you know, folks within your community, you know their various needs, and you know how to, um, you know, how to interact with them and how to build that trust mm -hmm. uh, so that you don't have you know, instances or fatalities and things like that, you, you, what you have is, um, you know, a healthier community where you, it's more like a family. And um, so I appreciate, you know, that that was his focus. You know, how can I build um, a larger family within my community to help protect the kids, you know, within this community and um, be a a loving role model and like father figure to them and to be an aid and an asset to families within the community. So um, that's, he's the reason that I have a positive outlook on, um, on officers where I know that there are some who are in it for the wrong reason because of the, just the sheer nature of, um, of law enforcement. You no. know, they came from, you know, um, plantations and overseers, you know, being brutal and uh, being punitive and harming and instilling fear in people. And so I understand that, you know, that a lot of that has been passed down 
throughout generations where you have people going into law enforcement for these wrong reasons just to cause harm. But then I appreciate that um, God has me connected because God knew that part of my calling was to be a legislator and part of my calling was to help serve within the community. So I need to be able to see different sides, you know. So I'm, I appreciate having a father, you know, who was a loving police officer yes. before he retired and, you know, and him sharing with me his motives and his reasons for going into law enforcement, you know, and serving our country as a Marine, you know, was to help people survive, yes. help people, you know, um, feel safe and secure. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm thankful to God. That I have, that I understand the history, and that I, you know, that I see um, love within that entity, and know that there are some good police officers out mm -hmm. there that are trying to, you know, do good things within our communities um, to help make it safer for all of us. Yes, yes, and another learning um, to share coming out of your experiences with. Uh, uh, the schools and, and understanding, you know, how things can be right and how you can heal. Mm -hmm. Today, your son is an educator himself, right? Well, he's um, he's in social work, <laughs> okay. so, which is a form of education. He, um, as a um, an eighth grader, um, because he was playing basketball, um, but he was struggling with the anxiety and depression. Um, with his autism and um, so he it, it, it was helpful as a parent you know to keep him involved in um, as much as we could <clears throat> because he wasn't naturally like making you know making friends so you know as parents we're like well how can we help him you know stay connected to his peers so um, Northern Kentucky University is where my husband and I met, we're alum. And my, my son's now an alum of Northern Kentucky University and, uh, with a, a background. So I, I, I want to encourage folks too, like even though, you know, folks are on the, the spectrum, like we can still, you know, um, learn and um, excel and thrive. And um, there's just, you know, challenges when it comes to like, social, you know, interactions and processing, um, even myself, you know, take a minute to, you know, like respond, you know, to certain things because I'm processing what's been said to me, what do I, and how can I, and, but it takes a lot of practice with that. Um, but um, as an eighth grader, he, he had uh, grew up going to the basketball camps at Northern Kentucky University. Mm -hmm. So we had him in that and they had scholarships and we, had, we were on teacher income. So the scholarships were really a blessing so that he could be a part of the basketball camps at NKU. And um, his eighth grade year, they could no longer get the scholarships <laughs> for some reason. So if you were eighth grade through 12 or 11th grade, um, you had to pay. Mm -hmm. You couldn't get the scholarships anymore for the younger kids. So we was like, we said, well, you know what? We can't afford to <laughs> to pay. You know this. You know we're on a budget. We have right. on a teacher's budget. We we can't afford to send you to basketball camp this year. And it was pretty devastating for mm -hmm. him um, because he looked forward to that. Yes, every routine summer. for him and his routine. And so. Uh, so we said, you know, uh, one of my mentors had always, you know, taught me and shared with me, like, well, if you ever, you know, see if there's a problem, and I, I took this on as an activist too, a community advocate. Um, if you see a problem, create a solution. You know, how are you going to help, you know, solve that? So his, for him, as a kid, you know, his problem was, I can't go to camp, basketball camp. My right. parents can't afford to send me to, you right. know, to camp this year. So, um... So he thought about, well, I, you know, the kids at my elementary school, they can't afford to go to camp either. Mm -hmm. So um, so we encouraged him. We said, well, your dad coaches basketball there. He was on the team when he was in elementary. And we said, well, why don't you just go back 
and do a camp, a mini camp, you know, for the kids there. Get oh. back and be a leader and a role model for them. And that's what he was like, oh, wow. So he asked his teammates, you want to try this, you know, with me? And they were like, yeah. So they taught the kids through some of the fundamentals of basketball. And then they also did a panel for them because other kid, little kids love listening to and they look up to middle and high school kids. Right. And so they did a panel discussion um, talking about how they can um, deal with bullying and how they can um, have good character, how they can give back in their school and community. And the kids loved it. And NKU partnered oh, with nice. him. So it was his, it's his sportsmanship champ camp. And NKU would send a player and the coach would come and they'd talk to the kids and they'd help with the basketball camp. They'd give tons of free basketball t-shirts and stuff like that and giveaways for the kids. And we'd have lunch and after they'd learned all the basketball skills and drills. And then we'd have like a little um, luncheon and ceremony where we give out awards and the mayor would come. That's nice. So um, he even received the uh, key to the city of Covington. Oh. From the mayor. It was Mayor Bowman, Denny Bowman at that, at that time. time. Denny Bowman. <laughs> yes. And then he would come to the sportsmanship champ camp. <laughs> wow. And uh, we would get a grant from the Greater Cincinnati Foundation to help. That was mm -hmm. nice. Mm -hmm. um, so as an, that's his education piece, even though he's in social work. Um, his education piece is every summer since eighth grade, so it's been over like 14, 15 years. Wow. Mm -hmm. Every summer he does a free chant camp for kids. And, and it's at one of the Covington schools? Well, it was at Latonia Elementary for a long time until my husband retired. Uh-huh. Because um, it was easier, you know, to, um, to implement there. But then what we would do is to keep it free, just kind of integrate the program within like churches, vacation Bible schools, oh. because it was easier um, because because uh, they invite the kids from the community. Vacation Bible school is always free, you know, right. and um, and then they can learn some of the fundamentals. During, it's the outdoor activity piece. Right. Um, and so even though there's no religious part to sportsmanship champ camp, there is this character building piece. And so talking about how it's important to be a good sport as an athlete and a fan. Right. And so they would incorporate that. How do you be a good teammate? How can you, you know, um, be a good, a good sport? And that um, the fan piece, too, a lot of people don't think about, like, oh, yeah, you need to be a good sport as a fan. Right. <laughs> But that's that's uh, wonderful that this is something that has been ongoing all these years. The high school students and college students, if yes. they'd like, they're helping to lead um, and helping to teach, you know, character building and, and how to be a good sport as an athlete and a fan. Mm. And they're helping and they love helping the kids. With, okay, this is how we do this, you know, drill and this is how we, you know, um, they help the kids with those fun fundamental skills. Of basketball, so it's a lot of fun. And well, that's awesome mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, for him to be able to turn around uh, that experience into something positive like yeah. that that's been ongoing all these years. Yeah. Definitely, uh, <laughs> you know, a need. And uh, the, the fact that I, I'm i assuming, but maybe I'm wrong, it does uh, focus on some needs of folks on the autism spectrum to yeah. cause attention to being sure that you understand and keeping up with that training and that learning too. Yes, so um, so the amazing part um, of it all is that he accommodates kids with all of all abilities because he's an individual on the spectrum, and um, you know, and so he makes sure that all the kids feel included and are able to um, to participate to their fullest ability, and so that's amazing. So he's very mindful of that. Good. That is amazing. Well, Serena, I tell you, you know, there's been so much to talk about. Uh, you and your experiences and uh, particularly honing in on the piece that uh, ties into the solidarity and the resiliency theme of the interview and the project. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to share with us as far as what are your hopes for the future? You know, what are you thinking about? What else needs to be done that you know that you're just going to be a part of it? Oh, thank you. 
Well, first, I, I just um, want to encourage folks. Uh, I want to say thank you for this amazing opportunity mm -hmm. and You're for welcome. capturing history. It's so important. And, um, you know, that we know our history so that we know where we're going, so that we can make improvements and changes, um, you know, and build, you know, uh, healthier communities and, um, and a healthier democracy so that we can just be better people. And so I just wanted to, um, to just share, you know, how important it is to like know our history. And this right here is um, a book that my, this right here is the draft. We do have a, a, a hard bound um, book. It's our family book, but, you know, to encourage people, you know, to go to the local libraries. I love the library. I grew up in the library. My kids grew up in the library, but, you know, encourage folks to go and visit their local library. They help you trace your history, um, learn their history, and then document that, you know, create, uh, create a book. You know, of your family history, there we have family trees in here. You know, different oh, that's nice. um, parts of the family. Um, add some photos too. I I love taking pictures, <laughs> and that you know. So this draft um, doesn't have a lot of photos in there, but all of the family trees, you know, within our family lineage is in here, um, from the Daniels, the Baker Parks. Um, you know, so. Um, that's very important. Yes, it is. <laughs> you know, <laughs> to learn, you know, learn our history. That helps us understand, you know, where we come from and the values, you know, that our parents and our forefathers had. Mm -hmm. Helps us understand who we are and why we think the way that we do and why we're passionate about, you know, this. Like, I'm passionate about social justice. I'm passionate about education. I'm, you know... Even, you know, my grandmother, you know, working in the school, she retired, I think, after like 30-something or 40 years, you know, serving in the schools. Um, but she would go to Frankfurt and advocate, you know, for, you know, other um, educators and the staff at the school. And, and so, um, you know, I, I grew up, you know, seeing that. And then my mom, you know, with NAACP and um, voter empowerment. Um, helping to educate, you know, folks about how they can be involved in, um, you know, in this democracy. And, um, so learn, you know, history. I just, and for the future, I want to see more people doing that, like learning more about themselves, their families, where they come from, um, so they can understand and make a plan for where they want to be. Um, and as an educator, I want to do what I can to help with that. So that's why I love, you know, being an educator and serving, you know, in education on the school board and then also um, serving as just volunteering, you know, within the, the school district and the community. So in the future, I wanna, would love to see more people doing that. Just um, passionate about loving others, you know, loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. Yes. Um, which is my favorite scripture. And uh, doing all that we can to lead in the spirit of love and empathy and, uh, and doing all that we can to help others. I wish everyone's calling in life was to help. And I do believe, actually, that God created us so that we could do that. Yes. You know, so that we all could use the abilities and the talents and gifts he gave us. To help others so in the future I guess you know just in general you know I would just love to see you know more inclusive loving healthy you know community and democracy for everyone where we all um, are building those relationships and moving and um, uh, in the spirit of solidarity you know together uh, so that so that we can help build a, a better you know community, world, society for everyone. All so, right. In the spirit of love, thank you. That's right. Well, thank you so much. You're I welcome. love you. Thank you. Love I you. love what you do. And I want to encourage you to keep on doing it for as long as you can. Thank you. Thank you for my being God. my guest today, Miss Serena Baker Owen. Thank you.